Thank you, Matt, once again. Um, our next talk is going to be by Mikhail Malholova. He's our software developer, and he's been uh, working in Java, Linux for over 10 years. Um, at H2O, um, he's the author of the Sparkling Water package, which is uh, H2O's implementation on top of Spark. Um, and he has a PhD from Charles University in Prague and a postdoc from Purdue. Without further ado, Mikhail. Hello, thank you. Oh, does it work? Okay. Thank you for the uh, introduction. So I'm Michal, and I will tell you something about sparking water and how it works uh, with uh, like H2O and why, what's, what was the motivation for sparking water. And I will show you also a simple demo like to, to see how, how to use it, how it's really simple to use it. So you saw here, uh, oops. Okay, thank you. You saw here like uh, different point of view like of the HTO, different like usage of HTO from R, from Python, from the flow. And in this talk, I would like to speak about how to run HTO on the top of the Spark. The Spark is another open source project in memory computation engine, which really focus on general computation. Most of the people using Spark, let's say for data managing or some data transformation and we put these two tools together and created the project which is called Sparking Water. So it's a combination of HTO and Spark. And in fact, it brings you uh, transparent integration of the HTO algorithms to the Spark ecosystem. That means that you can run any HTO algorithm you see here before GBM, GLM, K-means with Spark data and vice versa. So that means if H2 algorithm provides some table, you can take this table and process with the Spark API. And we figured out that this is really great for people who already have some uh, Spark pipelines, which are doing a lot of data managing or data, data pre-processing, and then they need at the end some powerful machine learning tool. And that's perfect fit for, for H2. So what are the benefits? From the Spark view, the benefit that Spark has also like machine learning library, which is called MLIP, and they have additional algorithms, which we don't have in uh, HTO. Algorithms supporting, let's say, text analysis, like word to vec or TF-IDF. They have also a really nice API. I really like their API because it's like motivated by functional style of programming, which are composing transformation with data, and then at the end you say evaluate. It's really nice to program with that API. And also they have like a concept of the pipeline. So you can, con you can compose different transformation together and uh, deploy or uh, create a pipeline, which at the end, let's say, produce a model, produce some uh, data, or just you know, compute something. On the other hand, in h we have algorithms, which are really powerful and really tuned uh, with respect to the performance, accuracy, and like, uh, which are fully parallelized and distributed. You also, uh, so that we have like a lot of advanced features in the algorithms, different stopping criterions. You can say, I'm just interested in the models which, which, uh, which are built, let's say, in two minutes with this, like, uh, with this error. And that's our goal, to have like really powerful machine learning. Also, we provide like this graphical environment flow, which you see, and also R and Python API. You can implicitly used with the h which is running on the top of the Spark. So there are several use cases how you can use sparkling water, how you can use h on the top of the Spark. The simple use case is the simple model builder. That means that you have some data source, load data to the Spark, do some data managing the Spark. Most of the people process differ different uh, data sources, uh, merge them to together, clean the data, and then at the end they pro uh, provide a table which is the perfect data input for HTO. So we just take this table of data and uh, pass it to the HTO algorithms. And in HTO algorithms, it will produce a model, and people will just take this model and use it in the rest of the pipeline to make a, pre a prediction, make a table of probabilities, and process uh, later in the Spark. So this is the first use case. The second use case is data managing. 
So I mentioned at the beginning that Spark is very really powerful in, for, in data managing, but uh, you saw from the previous, uh, previous talk that we also doing some uh, work with data managing, big joins, and also that operations. We can launch any operation around the cluster which will modify data. And there is a like, huge difference between the H2 and Spark in this sense, because we are modifying data in place. So this is perfect fit if, for example, if we are imputing missing values, so in, in Spark, you have to write a transformation of the data to a new data, which will put there a new values. In H2, we just run simple distributed tasks going around the cluster and just filling on the defined places in the data predefined value. So it's really, it's really uh, fast and memory efficient, let's say. And you can combine these data managing operation in H2 with data managing operation in Spark. It's quite a powerful feature. And the last, the last use case, which, I, uh, which is my favorite, is the stream processing. And that's really a use case which you can see uh, from people using in production. So they have typically two pipelines. One is modeling pipeline, which is producing models. So they have some data source, you know, like uh, uh, HDFS or S3. They load the data, let's say, to the Spark. Preprocess data again, build a H2 model at the end. And then they have separated pipeline, which is some kind of streaming pipeline. They have probably some Spark streaming or Storm deployed there, or even Flink, which is getting uh, uh, popularity right now. And in this pipeline, they do some simple, you know, even processing, and then they take H2 model. And as Erin mentioned during the training, we can export the H2 model in two forms. One is a binary form, which is dependent on H2, but we can also export the model as a code, as a, we call it POJO. And the POJO itself is independent on H2. So that means it's a really simple code. You can take it and put it to your production pipeline which is really great. You don't need to have any dependencies on Spark. You don't need to have any dependencies on H2. You have just called deployable artifact and streaming pipeline, so we put them together. And this is one of the most favorite use cases which, you can, which we can see, processing uh, streaming data with the POJOS. So they, these are like three main use cases how you can use Spark in water in uh, uh, in your cluster. And I will, instead of speaking about details, technical details, I will show you a demo and show you how to, how to really easily use Spark API with H2 API inside or from the Flow UI. So first step, I will launch Sparking Water. So I said that Sparking Water is integration H2 inside the Spark. So I will use the Spark, I will use the Spark command to Spark submit, command to launch a Spark job, and I will specify also, it's called Spark package. That's a way how Spark distribute some additional plugins to the Spark. And one of the plugins is, uh, is Spark in water. So I just specify this, and Spark will figure out uh, where is the plugin located, it will download the plugin, and launch it inside the Spark cluster. So I will switch to the console and, okay, perfect. Make it a little bigger and run a Spark Summit. So I will just run this command. You can ignore it for now. It will just launch the Spark and uh, print a lot, uh, lot of technical data about the environment. And then inside the job, inside the Spark job, we create so-called H2 context. And H2 context is the representation of the H2 cluster on the top of the Spark cluster. And H2 context itself is just handle, but it's handle for H2 cluster. And H2 cluster provides all the services you saw before. So it provides the REST API, it provides the R integration, and also Python integration, and also it provides the Flow UI. So I will just open this Flow UI, and it's the same UI you saw before. So really, I'm running right now H2 on the top of the Spark. 
and I prepare simple, simple uh, demo. So I will load this flow pack, which is our like distribution package for the for the Spark uh, for the H2 uh, notebooks, and build really simple example how to use Spark API with H2. So the example is called Bubbles, and what I will do, I will generate points in 2D space. Each point represents a bubble, and a bubble has two properties: weight and also the color. The points are generated in random. The weight is also random variable. By the color, depends on the x and y uh, on, uh, on the position of uh, of the point. So for this case, I will use Spark Spark API and generate these random points. So there is really I am in H2 in the H2 flow but I'm using the Spark API. So you can see there is like really transparent integration how to, how to deal with the Spark environment and with the Spark API. So I will just launch this guy and it will, I'm, print, I'm just creating random points, some data structure which is called in the Spark, uh, Spark data frame, just creating this guy. There is like no much, uh, no output because I print nothing. I can see only the status of the, the command. It's uh, OK, successful. When I prepare this data, I can publish this data for H2. So I mentioned at the beginning that we have something which is called H2 context. So I will use this H2 context, this handle to H2 services to ask them transfer me or publish me this spa data frame as h2 frame. So that's the next, next part of the command. So you can see as h2 frame. And it was, it finished successfully. Also, I didn't, uh, I didn't put there any output, so I'm just interested, okay, successful. Uh, it passed successfully, so that's perfect. But now I can use flow commands. So you can see during the training that there are like some flow commands, how to get the models, how to list the frames. So I will list the frames. And you can see there is a bubbles. And it's a data set which I created in the Spark. And I can look at the bubbles with the flow you know, API. I can look, there are four columns, X, Y, weight, and color. There are some properties of, of the columns. I can see max, mean. So common, common, uh, common, uh, common properties which are used from the H2 flow. And we can also call any functionality from the, from the uh, H2 flow. So in this case, I will just uh, transform the type of the color column from the string type to categorical type. And I can click directly on, in the flow, but in this case, I will just type the column directly. It will transfer and will transform the column to the this uh, demanded type, and we'll also output the, uh, the properties of the column. So you can see distribution of the red, blue uh, colors is almost the same, or the, the amount of the values. And I can also simply plot the bubbles. So I can write this piece of the, I call it flow code. I will not explain in more details, but I can print them directly in the flow. So this is the data which I create in the, in the Spark just list them and plot them inside the flow. And I can see properties of each bubble. So I can see the position, weight, uh, and the color, and you know, simply like uh, explore the data. So next, still, I should stress, I'm running on the Spark, so I can combine both APIs. So at the beginning, I used the Spark API. Now, now I'm using H2 API. With the, uh, with the data which I created in the Spark. So I, did, I will split these bubbles to two sets, one training, one for validation, and build simple GBM model. So it's really small data, 1,000 points, so it should be fast. Okay, it's done. So let's explore the model. And yeah, you can see you know, the, proper, uh, the graphs which uh, Erin showed during the training, log loss, AUCs. All the things are already there. And I can also, I can verify that the model is correctly built. So I said that uh, color was 
the, uh, the variable color was generated based on the position of the point, and the weight was the random variable. So you can see that from the variable importance, two top features are position and the weight as the, the lowest, the lowest uh, importance for this data. So I will skip all these rest summaries and make the prediction. So I will use validation data set and ask the model, give me the prediction, give me for the data, give me the prediction for the, for the bubbles. And it will tell me like red, red, blue, uh, red, blue, we've given probabilities. I can explore this prediction, but I will skip that. Oops, I have to close this. I will skip that. But one of the st additional steps, I will take this prediction and join it with the validation data. So I will have valid validation data, which I use for the prediction, with the prediction itself. So that was the command which I show. So this is the resulting table. So the prediction, blue red probabilities, and then input data. And what I'm interested, what is the error rate? for this, uh, for my prediction. So error rate means how many points have different values in the pre prediction column and color column. So I will just, I can compute that in H2, but I will use Spark API for this job. So I will take the prediction frame and publish it as Spark data frame. So again, I will use H2 context for this job and publish the data inside the Spark. In Spark, they are represented as the Spark data frame. You can see the, you can see the shape of data frame, or it's called schema in the Spark. And I can simply use the Spark API to compute the prediction error. So that means how many times I mispred, or how many times the model mispredicted, divided by the number of the, of the points which were predicted. And you can see the error rate is 24%. And really, I started with the Spark, uh, Spark data, then I switched to the H2, now I'm back in the Spark, and let me find the bubbles which are mispredicted. So I would like to visualize them. So I will use, again, uh, the Spark API to select all the points with different values in the predict and color columns, and publish them as H2 frame, and simply plot them. And at the end, I have output of all the bubbles which are misprected. And I visualize them in the way that you know, both colors are uh, in the graph. So you can see that uh, there was like 24% of points misprected in validation data. So that was quick, quick demo. Oops. And you can speak with us here. You can. Also, you can also visit Sparking Water Project because it's open source, so you can, uh, you can download it, you can try it, you can follow this demo because it's in the GitHub, and you can also visit or take a H2 Sparking, Sparking Water booklet where is the description of the Sparking Water uh, implementation, and also we are uh, hiring we are hiring the uh, Scala and Spark engineer to move with the Sparking Water projects. So thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you. I think we may have time for just one question, Fanny. Well, you mentioned at the end that you are hiring people from from uh, from uh, Spark to integrate. So I want to I want to know what what's the future of, of this project. So we have lot of we have lot of ideas. So several several uh, directions. Let's say the the major thing is like stabilization of whole infrastructure. You know, like migration to the Spark 2.0. This is the, the step which we are doing right now. We have also ideas with respect to the machine learning pipelines in the Spark. They would like to integrate H2 job, H2 algorithms inside them as with the Spark API, uh, deployment of these pipelines as like POJOS and 
like a lot of lot of ideas. But still, integration of both of both guys, and the the goal is to like give like the community or the Spark people or you know, developers, data scientists, a tool which will be really powerful in machine learning. Thank you, Mikal. Thank you.